Welcome to episode two of the Reception Perception Mailbag. I am, of course, Matt Harmon of Reception Perception. Let's kick this series off with the bang last week. A lot of great questions from our users in Discord. If, you don't, if you're not in the Discord, by the way, definitely make sure you get uh, all signed up. Get, join in there. Uh, the link will be below in the show notes, of course, so make sure you check that out. But let's waste no more time. Let's jump into a great set of questions here, starting with the first one here from my guy, Oscar Bobo. Realistically, who do you think are the best three receivers to actually make it to free agency this cycle? I think players like Higgins or Pittman are absolutely getting extended. I'm with you, Oscar, that yes, I think the three guys who are very likely to either be franchise tagged or stay with their teams are T. Higgins, Michael Pittman, and Mike Evans. I think Mike Evans is a Bucks lifer. I think they figure out a way to either tag him or keep him there, and they find a way to bring Baker Mayfield back. Pittman, I mean, there's no chance. I think he's the least likely to actually hit the market here. Um, I think he gets tagged or extended for sure. And then T. Higgins, man, at one point I thought there might be a chance that T. Higgins changes teams in the offseason. Now, after recent reporting from Paul Diener Jr. of The Athletic, that they're going to actually find a way to to tag him and keep him there for 24 they structured burrow's contract specifically to do that i think t higgins remains with the Bengals for one more year and then in 25 we're looking at either a tag and trade situation or him moving on in free agency so those guys are not hitting the open market so the top three to me i think calvin ridley is right on the borderline of staying or going if they extend him, the Jaguars extend him before the league year starts, they have to send a second round pick to the Atlanta Falcons. I don't think they want to do that, but I think they'd be fine. Send, they're already sending a third round pick. Like that's a done deal. So if they're able to bring him back after he hits free agency, I think they'd like to do that. I think Ridley liked them to do that. I think Trevor Lawrence would really like to have him back. That's what everybody has said publicly. But if he hits the open market, Somebody could blow him away with a big deal and he could go elsewhere. So I think he's likely hitting free agency, although I'd still say he's most likely to return to Jacksonville, even if he does. The next guy is Marquise Brown, who I will talk about Marquise Brown actually later in the show. So I won't go deep on him, but he's a guy that I think is hitting the open market. And then that last spot to me is kind of a toss up between Gabe Davis and Curtis Samuel. You guys know I love Curtis Samuel. I think he's a really good player, a guy that's been underrated for a long time, somebody that could be back. Um, in a, in a more featured role in a different offense. I think he actually is going to have a lot of suitors. Solid player can separate, can beat man coverage, and can be explosive after the catches. A lot of offenses that could use him. And then Gabe Davis, again, kind of right there tied with Curtis Samuel as a limited player, vertical X receiver, limited application, but a guy that could make sense for some of these teams All right, uh, out there. All right, let's pull up the next question here. This one comes in from Bobby Blumpkin. Do you think Michael Pittman is going to be in the conversation of elite with a full year of Anthony Richardson. So this is uh, just a situation where uh, I don't love the use of the word elite. I don't think Michael Pittman can get into the elite tier because I think that is a very small select group of like seven guys in the NFL. But I think he can be in the superstar tier. To me, he's kind of teetering him and Nico Collins, like those type of players, like we discussed on the podcast recently, James Coe and I kind of right there teetering between very good to superstar number one type of wide receivers. I think Pittman's right there in that group. Uh, what I will say though is, yeah, I think Anthony Richardson from a production standpoint can take Michael Pittman to places he has not gone before. I absolutely refuse to accept any notion that Gardner Minshew was anything other than a neutral or net negative to the offense last year in Indianapolis. Listen, they did not change the play calling when they went to Gardner Minshew. They were calling that style of offense with Anthony Richardson. And I really liked a lot of the flashes I saw from Richardson. So to me, yes, Pittman probably, again, I don't think in the elite conversation of receivers, as much as I love Michael Pittman, I've always been a Michael Pittman guy. I do think Anthony Richardson can push him higher in terms of pure production. All right, let's move on to the next question here. Uh, Packers Junkie says, since I forgot to submit my question for uh, episode one, no problem. Uh, I'll give you this one for episode two. Is Pop Douglas the real deal? Obviously, Demario Douglas of the New England Patriots is the question here. I liked a lot of what I saw from Demario Douglas as a rookie, a slot receiver who can beat man coverage. Those guys typically tend to go along, ironically, former Patriot. That Jacoby Myers, even again, Curtis Samuel type of always underrated, solid players. Like I think Pop Douglas has a future on this team. 
However, I'm not sure quite where the ceiling is yet. Um, I think that is still, I'm in a discovery mode with that one. But the fact that he can beat press man coverage, the fact that he can win on some of those short routes while also getting a little bit in the intermediate area, to me, says that he has staying power. The real question is, what the hell is New England going to do at basically every other spot? This team needs a quarterback. They need offensive line help. They need at least, I think, two more pass catchers. So where Douglas fits in that rotation when we kind of have it all sorted out I think it's still a big, outstanding question. All right, let's move on to the next one here. This one comes in from at Godfarve. Love it. Do you th have any concerns with Jahan Dotson's long-term production? Do you think Eric Bieniemy and quarterback play were mostly to blame, or is there anything you've seen that might be an issue? So, state of the state on Jahan Dotson. In his rookie season, really, really liked the profile, which to me was confirmation of what I saw in college which I really like the reception perception prospect profile on Jahan Dotson. Now, even though I liked Dotson as a college prospect, I didn't never really thought he had like a number one wide receiver ceiling. I thought he was going to be a long-term, really solid number two, um, sort, of, sort of like a Doug Baldwin type of ceiling. And like Doug Baldwin's a great player, okay? So th there's no disrespect in saying that he could be a Doug Baldwin type. Really liked Dotson as a prospect. Liked a lot of what I saw, his reception perception profile from a rookie season pointed to good things coming but year two uh was a disaster i'm gonna pull up this chart actually that my buddy jacob gibbs tweeted out and i, I quote tweeted it the other day uh just guys that have had from a, a production standpoint here's the original tweet uh from jacob these are players that are 24 years or younger round one draft capital 350 plus routes run in a season and a target per route run rate below 17 percent john dotson now has done that twice and you look at every other player on this list, it's full of nightmares. You know, I mean, like, what's the who's the best guy on this list? Nelson Aguilar? Uh, yeah, that's what we're looking at. Nelson Aguilar, like a competent veteran player, but not a guy, a guy who hit the ceiling that the Eagles wanted when they drafted him in round one, of course. So I, I will say, though, just from a on-film perspective, and I quoted this tweet saying this, like, his film, Jahan Dotson's rookie year film, is the clear outlier on this list. I mean, if you go back and look at the RP database, Jalen Rager's rookie year, disaster. Uh, Nelson Aguilar's rookie season, not that good. Quentin Johnston, disaster. Uh, Laquan Treadwell, obviously not good. Like, these guys all had bad film. I don't think Jahan Dotson, as a rookie, had bad film. So that's why I'm still okay betting on him as a guy that can go on to have career success and maybe be like, again, what I hope for as a prospect, a quality number two receiver. He just obviously was not that last year. I do think, as you pointed out, offensive environment and quarterback play were big issues for Dotson last season. So again, I, I want to keep the ceiling sort of tampered down a little bit here, but I'm betting on him, be, Jahan Dotson, being a quality player at some point. I will just say, the film last year was up and down. Like, I think when his full RP profile comes out, it's going to have some mixed results. They were very good games to start the season and then some legitimately poor showings from him as an individual last year. So I'm a little bit, just like you are clearly as you're asking the question, I'm a little bit confused as to what to do with Jahan Dotson right now as we stand here today. All right, let's move on to the next question here. This one comes in from JV45. Could you speak on Dave Canales and his scheme impacting Bryce Young and the Panthers offense? So, uh, yeah, I've been a big fan of Dave Canales, talked about it on the show, really liked what he did as Tampa Bay's offensive coordinator. I do think they were a little conservative at times, but I don't know how much of that is, hey, hey, he's uh, number one. He's from Pete Carroll's coaching tree. Pete Carroll's pretty conservative. Also, Todd Bowles, another conservative coach um, as the head coach there in Tampa Bay. So they ran a lot on early downs, but I think they married the run game and the pass game really well. I love that they kind of just allowed Baker Mayfield to drop back and point and shoot. They didn't ask him to process a lot. They didn't ask him to um, – they had a lot of like one-read throws to really good, talented players. That was good for Baker Mayfield. And, of course, they did a lot of really good things with Geno Smith, did Dave Canales and the boys in Seattle in 22. So I like – Dave Canales' offense, I think, it, again, what his offense is will hopefully just be catered to what Bryce Young can do well, which at this point I think is it's about processing. It's about getting the ball out quick. So I think we're actually going to see something pretty different from what Baker Mayfield was asked to do in Tampa Bay to what Bryce Young is going to be asked to do in Carolina. To me, it's really all about um, – I threw this comparison out recently. 
Dave Canales has to do what Sean McVay did for Jared Goff. Like from a efficiency standpoint, there's a lot of parallels between Bryce Young's rookie season and Jared Goff's rookie season. You got to hope that you can follow that sort of same mold where you bring in a good offensive lineman in free agency like the Rams did with Andrew Whitworth. You bring in a reliable veteran receiver like they did with Robert Woods. You get a second day hit like the Rams did with Cooper Cup. That's a lot of boxes to check for the Panthers who are light on resources right now. I also kind of wonder how Adam Thielen fits in here. How is it, Can they actually move Jonathan Mingo into a role that makes sense for him? Because what the hell they did last year with Jonathan Mingo was never going to work out. So a lot of questions for Carolina, but I do think Canales is a guy who's shown that he gets it. Next one up here, let's move on. This one comes in from uh, Zay, Zam Dank. Zam Dank, I don't know. Anyways, is there any hope for a Christian Kirk type of production jump for Hollywood Brown if he lands with the right team? Could he be top 24 in the right role? Uh, absolutely. I think there is a potential for this with Hollywood Brown. But you mentioned it. Uh, not only does he need to land with the right team, he has to land in the right role. And there's a couple of things I want, like a couple boxes I want to see checked here when we're talking about Hollywood Brown. I, I, I think he, again, right team for sure. We need the right team, right quarterback. But really, he needs to be deployed in the right role. I think Arizona... I like a lot of what they did last year. And like, they kind of had to throw him in this role because he was clearly their best receiver. But way too much boundary X receiver stuff for, Ho for Hollywood Brown with the Cardinals last year. That's not his strength. That's not where he's going to be consistently good. Like, you look at his RP profile. He's a guy that actually he's shown from 21, 22, like his years with the Ravens and then his first year with the Cardinals. It's a guy that can get open. He's a guy that could beat coverage. He could separate, but he's much better at beating zone coverage. We know in RP history, those are guys we want to see used at flanker and slot receiver. Not enough of that in Arizona for my taste, especially in Cliff Kingsbury's offense. Not enough of that in Arizona for my taste. So that's what I'm looking for in terms of Hollywood Brown. If he signs with the team that's going to deploy him in the right way. And of course, we need him to be with a good quarterback. All right, let's move on to the next one here. This one comes in from Contino. Deontay Johnson was a favorite, quote, bounce back candidate last year. He was, quote, your analyst's favorite positive TD regression candidate, and I had high hopes. Uh, of course, this year, we want to know what is Deontay Johnson going to do in this Arthur Smith offense? Uh, do we have some hope uh, is the second part of the question here in terms of w what do you think he's going to do in this offense? I find this to be fascinating because, you know, uh, if you've watched my content, you know I actually like Arthur Smith's offense. Uh, I think he calls good plays. I think he designs good plays. Um, and I think he's a much better offensive coordinator than he is a head coach. Like Arthur is clearly not made for the big chair, but I do think he can call plays and put players in the right position to win. I don't think he's really had a receiver tandem quite like a George Pickens, Deontay Johnson, when there's, where there's kind of two guys that can both play outside and do a variety of different things. So I don't know how he fits necessarily in this offense, but I trust Arthur Smith if they get the quarterback position right. And I've been saying this for months now. I do think Justin Fields ends up in Pittsburgh. That's my bet as we stand here right now. I think that Deontay Johnson and George Pickens, two guys that can beat man coverage, that fits with Justin Fields, that fits with what you're going to see if you're the uh, if, if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers with Arthur Smith as your uh, play caller there. I kind of like the way things are setting up in Pittsburgh right now if they can get the quarterback position right. All right, let's move on to the next one here. This one comes in from Sloopy64. Any hope for Elijah Moore? Can the Browns get more out of him? Seems like they try to turn him into a manufactured touch slash gadget guy, and they need to just let him be a wide receiver and go win. I agree with you. I didn't love the manufactured stuff with Elijah Moore. Like, this is a guy who's a route runner. He's a separator. He can beat man coverage. He can win vertical routes. I, I do kind of... I kind of fear, not even wonder, I just kind of fear that Elijah Moore is sort of going down that Curtis Samuel path of a guy that was really good in reception perception, good man coverage scores, good success rate versus man, good success rate versus press. But because of his size and because of kind of like teams wanting to get that player out in space and find explosive plays in that way, that we're going to kind of lose the plot here. We're going to kind of lose the thread with these players and they get sort of pigeonholed into this manufactured touch role, which is fine. Like I think Elijah Moore was a solid player for the Browns last year, but, and look, it was a disaster of an offense, even with Joe Flacco in there. Like we remember the high moments and the fun part of the Joe Flacco experience, but they were a bottom five offense with him in EPA paper drop back and success rate. It was not a consistent offense with Flacco on the field. To me, I think 
it just wasn't a good environment for almost any of these receivers beyond Amari Cooper. But I do kind of I, I've been lowering my expectations for who Elijah Moore can be as a player because I kind of think he's getting uh, pigeonholed and typecasted into this create a touch gadgety type of player when really I'd like to see him just go down the field, run routes and win. And, and when Amari Cooper wasn't on the field, the Browns let him do that. I'd like to see more of that stuff. I'm not sure we're going to see that with Deshaun Watson at quarterback, which is a whole nother issue all on its own. All right, next question up here. We've got from uh, our buddy, Josh Scott, part one, uh, follow up to the first mailbag. What are some key traits that help you differentiate between having faith in a DJ Moore slash Amon Ross St. Brown type and guys that have similarly performed poor early uh, on that you don't have the faith in type of guys. So we talked about this uh, sort of, I think it was Kai Bourbon uh, or Kentucky Bourbon guy said in the first one, you know, who's a guy that impressed you in terms of start off poorly in reception perception and grew into being a really good player. I named DJ Moore in that. I don't think Amon Ross St. Brown fits in this. Um, he has improved his ability to beat man coverage, but I would say that what stood out about him right away was he was a big slot receiver, power slot receiver that could beat zone coverage was at 80%, slightly above 80% success rate versus zone coverage in his rookie season. So like, I didn't really care about his man coverage scores at that point. I was mostly focused on Kenny beat zone coverage. We saw that in his year one data. That's why we bought into Amon Ross St. Brown immediately. And especially in his second season when Let's not forget, there were some haters and losers on the Amon Ross St. Brown stuff uh, in his first uh, coming out of his first season. So focusing on DJ Moore, why I still had faith in DJ Moore. And, and listen, I was certainly at the time skeptical of, OK, can he improve this route running? The reason I never fully gave up on DJ Moore was his cost, his, excuse me, his prospect profile, his college profile was really good. Um, he had a really good reception perception profile from a collegiate standpoint. The data there was good. It's not on the website because this was back when I was working with the fantasy footballers. I, I think that article actually exists somewhere on the internet still, but he showed he could beat man coverage in college. He showed um, even if the route running wasn't yet nuanced in college that he had the athletic skills and some of the traits to grow and develop those. Obviously from a year one standpoint, a rookie standpoint, that did not translate, but it did eventually translate. So the guys I'm going to keep the faith in when they perform poorly in success rate versus man press, et cetera, as rookies are the guys that had good college profiles. I'm willing to go back to the well with those players, even if they perform poorly in RP in year one. Now a guy that, you know, kind of on the other side of it, like a, you know, I'm, Quentin Johnson's a good example. Like he had a very mixed profile uh, in his reception perception prospect uh, showing there. So I did not, I'm not fully like, buying back in on Quinton Johnson, if that kind of makes sense, gives you a little bit uh, of sort of a measuring stick there. All right, let's go on to the next one here. These all, the next few ones are going to be kind of like higher level RP mechanism questions. So um, if you're not super interested in reception perception, like what goes into the nitty gritty of the details, all that, maybe, maybe this next part of the video is not for you. But before you go, definitely make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, leave a comment the whole thing would love your support as they continue to do some more stuff on YouTube here but anyways Richard the handyman says Matt how do you determine which eight games to sample and how do you avoid bias you have mentioned specific examples where you've taken samples from post games bowl games etc which may have a higher competition level you also uh, intentionally sampled so-called signature games for players you typically try to pick only the highest level games a uh, great question, Richard. So uh, if you're not familiar with reception perception, I sample eight games for every NFL pro profile, unless they were injured, of course, and they only played like five or six or something like that, uh, which will always be noted on the website when that is the case. For college players, I try to get eight games. It's just harder to come by the film for college than it is for NFL, which is NFL is widely available. Um, so I always try to do eight games when possible. Now, so again, with college, I, tr I mostly take what I can get. Uh, I, I do, again, try to mix in levels of competition here. I think we have another question coming later about level of competition, so I'll, I'll save that for there. But thinking about for NFL players specifically, uh, I, I get a mix of games in there. I always try to get one game against their, each individual uh, division opponent just because there's some familiarity there. If I know they're going to be playing like a high-level cornerback in a game, I'm going to sample that game for sure. 
Um, and, and then really it's, it's a mix of productive, unproductive games. Like I, 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 a guy has four catches for 38 yards. That's making it in the sample. He has seven catches for 150 and two touchdowns. That's making it in the sample. So I try to get a wide range of games. Um, and really, it's just about like snaps played too. I'm not going to sample if, for example, a guy plays, you know, 10 snaps in a game. I'm, I'm not taking that really into the sample if, uh, when possible. I'm trying to get games where they played a lot. So it is um, not a hard and fast in terms of like this is the method, this is the rule, but. Uh, for me, I'm, it, it's more of a guideline. Like I want to take games that are a mix of productive, unproductive. I want to take a mix of home and away games. I want to try to get, if I know they faced a really good defense or different um, kind of high quality cornerbacks, I want to take those into the mix as well. So uh, I do think that that's kind of just like diving into the process of game selection, which again, more so on the NFL level than the college level. Let's move on to the next one here. Uh, Cavalier Domer, part one. And this was, I think, what I was just talking about here. Do you account for slash how do you account for quality of coverage when charting, especially in press man scenarios? Besting a scrub DB versus Legarius Sneed is a huge difference. And I would uh, I would think it would skew data. Also, uh, potential for better wide receivers drawing DBs could affect it. Uh, yeah, so there is no uh, accounting for level of competition for a variety of reasons. Number one, you're going to see a bunch of different corners in the game. Uh, we know that shadow coverage is very rare these days. Sneed actually is a good example of a guy that does do a lot of shadowing, did do a decent bit of shadowing last year, but he's a rare exception to the rule. Um, now, again, when, when it comes to college players, I, and not every analyst is going to treat you this way, I'm going to treat you all like adults, and I'm going to assume that you're not stupid. Like, Great, and I'll just use an example of this, right? Think back to Sky Moore. I call this the Sky Moore corollary in 2022. He had great success rate versus man, press, zone, everything like that. If you looked at it, if you just sorted by success rate versus man or press or whatever, he was one or two in the class up there with Chris Olave. But again, I trust you all not to be stupid and compare like, okay, Sky Moore to Drake London. He's got better success rate versus man. Therefore, he is better. No, we all know that the guys that Drake London is facing are better than the players that Sky Moore is facing at Western Michigan. Um, now, I still like Sky Moore as a prospect, but that's, again, just sort of – that's how you, in your head, account for that level of competition. You are you can give it like a you know a, a, an asterisk, a discount, whatever you want to say. There is some level of accounting for it there. Now, on the NFL level, I personally believe – that it's much flatter. Like there, when we're looking at different college conferences, yeah, there's going to be a big jump in level of competition from the SEC down to the damn guys that Sky Moore is playing with. Again, sorry to keep bagging on Sky Moore, who I met at Super Bowl week and I thought was a really nice guy and had a great conversation with him. So sorry, Sky Moore, I, I do apologize. But when we're looking at NFL uh, players, I do think the level of competition is a little bit more flat than when we're looking at college. So for me, again, I'm going to try to account for that within the sample of games. I'm going to try to get, when possible, the players that are going against really good defensive backs. When you see a Legereus scene on the schedule, I'm going to try to take that into the sample. So again, that kind of, I think, answers that question. Um, naturally, I'm not able to like wait, okay, this guy had harder coverage than this guy because like, how would I do that unless I went in and charted every cornerback? And that's absolutely not going to happen. So, um, we, and, and by the way, there's not a ton of like, hey, this fourth string receiver has a high success rate versus man, or it's overly inflated, something like that. So, anyways, I think that kind of answers that question there. All right, let's bring up the next one here. Uh, Connor Evans says, do you think receivers need an additional skill slash attribute beyond great route running ability for them to be truly elite? Like, reception perceptions. Always like Tyler Lockett, but did he ever, did he ever really have uh, an elite ceiling? Yeah, so the short answer to this is absolutely. <laughs> um, and yeah, he never really had a chance to be that elite type of receiver there. The short answer to this, yeah, again, is, is absolutely. Um, now, I think that there were things to Tyler Lockett's game that were more than just route running. Great hands, great and tight coverage. I, I, it's hard to say what takes a guy from being in that, to me, superstar tier. Like we posted a video about this recently on the, on the page. You can check this out. You can listen to the full podcast with James Coe. Differentiating the guys that are on the elite tier versus the superstar tier, which is I think tier one and tier two of NFL receivers. And then there's 
just a, a large tier of like very good number one receivers. It's hard to say what, what takes a guy from tier two to tier one, but there is a difference. Um, I do think the guys that we're, we're talking about here, Jefferson, Chase, Lamb, uh, A.J. Brown, Antonio Brown in his day, these elite players, they had truly like 95th-ish percentile success rate versus man scores or press at different times as well. That's that that's higher than Tyler Lockett was reaching even in his best years. Uh, but I think there is something to it from a physical standpoint, from a contested catch standpoint, really from an after catch standpoint um, that you're looking at that you need beyond just great route running. Look, I love route runners. I love separators, but there is something else that you need beyond those, in my opinion, um, just this are the route runners in terms of being elite. So the short answer to that is, yeah, ab absolutely. You definitely do. All right. I think our last one up here, Steelers fan, what's your favorite hobby outside of football? For the people that submit questions, I'm always going to take one non-football question here to wrap these mailbag episodes up. My favorite hobby outside of football is easily cooking, barbecuing, smoking meats. Um, that, that's, that's my thing, man. Cooking on the big green egg outside. Uh, got the Blackstone out there too. Uh, I, I got obsessed with this stuff. Like a few years ago, my wife actually got me my first big green egg for Christmas several years ago, uh, which was the small one back in our tinier, uh, smaller place in El Segundo there, since upgraded to the XL. Shout out to Big Green Egg. Um, that's that's my favorite hobby. Just d discovering new, and even in this, the kitchen too. Falling in love with cooking was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Uh, I think, f you know, people ask me about weight loss and uh, health. That's another one of my, like, obsessions and hobbies. Obviously, have a full story on that. If you want to check out my pinned tweet uh, on Twitter, X, whatever we're supposed to call it these days got a whole background in that like for me actually losing weight a big part of it was falling in love with cooking now look I cook things that aren't technically healthy all the time either but finding new things new ingredients new uh or new recipes the whole thing that for me is like uh, it, it's the thing that brings me some of the most joy I, I just I love cooking for people I love preparing meals you know for crowds for guests whatever to me, that has got to be my biggest hobby outside of football. I love learning about it. Uh, I'm obsessed with like, I never wanted to be on TikTok or any of that crap, but I love being on there to find recipes and, and people doing barbecue stuff on there and learning new things. It's definitely something that uh, I would say is my biggest hobby and, and lights my fire for sure. All right, that's it. That's all the questions we have here for episode two of the Reception Perception Mailbag. Shout out to everybody in the Discord that sent in questions. Uh, we love you guys for it. If you're not in the Discord, again, go down below, find the link, you can join the Discord. There's a whole channel just dedicated to mailbag submissions. And there's a ton of other channels made for uh, everybody free to join. There's also premium channels if you have a Prime or Sicko subscription to receptionperception.com. And on that note as well, make sure you're signed up for a Reception Perception subscri subscription. This is the time, baby. Free agent charting is going to be rolling out in early March. Draft prospect charting will be soon to follow. Earlier than ever, draft prospect charting is going up on the site because you guys are obsessed with it and I am obsessed with it. So we got a big offseason ahead at Reception Perception. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the site. Get into Discord. Be a part of the community. And until next time, we're out.